मैडम मा बिस्मी गोपाला कृष्णन मैडम मा गिरिजा एंड माय डियरेस्ट फ्रेंड डॉक्टर गिरीश कुमार एंड ऑल रिस्पेक्टिव टीचर्स एंड डियर पार्टिसिपेंट्स अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रॉम गुवाहाटी रेदर अ वेरी प्लेजेंट मॉर्निंग फ्रॉम गुवाहाटी i'll i'll just take a minute uh, you know i have to share the ppt but prior to that you know uh, i was just listening very carefully to uh, mr uh, rubin and he had very rightly pointed out about the uh, lectures you know uh, this is something uh, where we are not doing justice to our students in most of the cases in the year 2004 uh, i went to cardiff law school cardiff university uk which happened to be the fifth uh, uh, most prestigious university in the uk and uh, we we did uh, a certificate course there on law teaching and legal research skills now when i was just uh, looking at the modules which uh, we were supposed to do there we were supposed to go to llb classes llm classes we, we were supposed to observe the teaching skills there one of the modules was how to prepare uh, a lecture and uh, you know how to deliver it now there were like uh, I'll, I'll just please please uh, just a minute just a minute I'm I'm sorry, you know, you have to bear with these nuances, you know, because because uh, I have to rush to high court uh, to meet the chancellor immediately after the lecture. Uh, so uh, when I saw one of the modules was how to prepare and deliver a lecture, so I had a question in mind. I, I thought that uh, I am already a teacher for last more than a decade, right? So what are they going to tell us about how to prepare and deliver a lecture? and the same question must be there in the mind of everybody who is present here what uh, new he is going to tell us you know because we have been teaching for last so many years friends uh, i was waiting for that module and uh, i'm telling you honestly that uh, it really changed my perception about uh, the lecturing and uh, you know we do all of us do a lot of hard work you know when we prepare a lecture honestly but then the question is how effectively we deliver a lecture and uh, you know in how, you know in what manner do we prepare it so that we could uh, provide better content to them we we can better communicate as uh, uh, mr Rubi, uh, dr ruvet had already pointed out so on the basis of uh, my training at cardiff law school my experiences as a student and as a teacher right i i prepared uh, this particular uh, ppt and i have written a paper also which of course will be uh, published uh, soon in a book which we are publishing on teaching and research methods from nlu assam i'll share my ppt and uh, just give me a minute please can you see this yes sir yes great yeah <clears throat> so it is how to prepare and deliver a lecture so i have like divided my uh, entire ppt into two parts one is about the preparation of lecture and another one is on its delivery now when we talk of the first part effective delivery of a lecture is an art you know here i'm just talking of both the things you know effective delivery i have used the word effective we do the delivery of the lecture every day but then the question is is the delivery effective that, that is the most important thing however 
preparing a lecture in a structured manner to make it more meaningful for students is equally important. So uh, there are two segments, one about the preparation of the lecture and another one is about the effective delivery of that particular lecture. Now, uh, chalk and talk method is a traditional and the most popular mode of teaching everywhere in the country. And there are two very strong reasons for its adoptions. One, that it is beneficial to the institutions because it is very cost effective. And second, about its wide acceptability among the students. There are many other methods like flip classes, clinical legal method, cooperative teaching method, problem solving methods, gamification method, etc. I'm not going to talk about these methods. I'm, I'll be confining by and large on a lecture which is based on chalk and talk or where we use the PPT as I'm doing right now. Prepare a lecture in the light of contemporary development. That is something which is extremely important. Normally, what do we do? We prepare a lecture in the isolation, you know, just on the basis of the legal provision, we prepare and then we just deliver that. Uh, we need to prepare it in the light of contemporary developments, give latest examples in the lecture, what exactly is happening in the society, make critical analysis of the judgments and the legislations, and if a bill is introduced in the parliament, which is related to your subject, refer to its clauses while teaching. But you have to be careful. You will be, you must be telling them that, look, it is a bill or it is a draft bill, right? You know, if it is a bill, it may be passed. It may not be passed. If it is a draft bill, then obviously, you know, it is uh, open for the public uh, for discussion and thereafter there will be changes and the bill will be introduced. So you, you will just tell them that this is not a law, but this is what the legislature uh, plans to do that. I'll give you one example here. Uh, when I when I say that prepare a lecture in the light of uh, contemporary developments. Now, in one of the LLB classes uh, uh, in the Cardiff Law School, as I told you that uh, we were supposed to observe their teaching skills also. And uh, uh, I really uh, observed many things, good and bad, and uh, I'll be sharing certain things with you. Now, there was a professor <coughs> uh, who delivered a lecture, and uh, it was for two hours. Now, the two hours class is very long class, actually. Now, the interesting thing was that this professor had made certain uh, uh, slides, you know, which were to be used to uh, OHP overhead projector. So the classroom was like, you know, it was a huge theater hall, you know, big hall. There must be somewhere around 250 uh, students, you know, sitting in that class. Uh, it was really difficult to get a seat. Uh, we got a seat uh, at the end of the class, you know. Now, there was a podium uh, which uh, was being used by the teacher. There was a touch screen. This I'm telling you of 2004, 18 years back, the kind of, you know, things which they used to use. So podium with a touch screen, then on one side there was overhead projector and of course the LCD projector was hanging, you know, uh, in between. So the professor had uh, made some o uh, OHP slides and she uh, had shown those slides. Those slides were basically made of the newspaper clippings. Right. So this is what exactly was happening in the society. She had shown those slides and then she started her lecture, which was covering those kind of events, those kind of developments. So I found it to be quite effective. But then again, the question is how many of our educational institutions have these kind of facilities? You know, even till date in Delhi University, Greece, uh, Greece is, uh, uh, you know, witness to it that we do not have LCD projectors uh, in working situation in uh, uh, you know, our classrooms and hardly anybody makes the PPT presentation. You know, uh, this is a sorry state of affairs, but then this is the truth. And there is just like a multi-purpose hall, uh, which is which we normally call as a moot court hall. So all activities are happening in that particular hall where there is uh, you know LCD projector. <coughs> 
Now, you just think of so many private colleges which are mushrooming. There are so many universities also. How many of them have these kind of technological, uh, you know, facilities, these uh, equipments? But then that was something which was uh, very good. But even if you do not have OHP or even if you do not have LCD, nobody stops you from discussing the latest event which are related to your subject and then start your lecture and then try to connect, you know, how, how your lecture can be useful. And, you know, this will give uh, some sort of, you know, uh, like uh, motivation uh, to the students to apply your lecture in the given situations and try to find out, you know, what can be the solution of the uh, problems which are prevailing in the society at that point of time. But of course, you, you, need to, you need to be extra, extra careful. If there are sensitive matters, I repeat, if there are sensitive matters, please avoid them to discuss in the class. Because, you know, the students from all pol political ideologies, they sit there and, you know, uh, there may be issues if you are referring to some something which is quite sensitive. I have seen things uh, taking ugly shape, uh, you know, where the teacher might have made some sort of comment or so. So please do not touch about the sensitive issues as such, unless a specific question has been asked to you. and. Your answer should be related uh, based on law and not on your ideology or not on anything else. So you need to be extra careful uh, while delivering a lecture in the class. Then moving further, <clears throat> a good lecturing does not mean uh, reading a lot and vomiting everything in front of students, right? Good lecturing means preparing your lecture in advance by structuring it properly and delivering it in a manner which is easy for the students to understand. Now, uh, you know, we all are academicians. We read a lot. There is absolutely no doubt. We, we, uh, we read so many books, you know, like if you have a, if you have a class on constitution, for example, now, if you are reading a uh, survey uh, for that particular class, See, what will happen is that you will spend so much of time and after reading 10 pages, you will find that there is only one uh, uh, paragraph or two paragraphs which are relevant for the class. So you have to be, you know, very particular when you are going for the class, when you are preparing for the class, you need to prepare your uh, lecture in a structured manner. For your own study, for your research, you can uh, read Sirvai, you should read Sirvai, you should read many other books, you know, by the prominent authors. But while going to the class, it is not that whatever you read, you just go and tell, start telling the students, you know, now that will not serve any purpose. So therefore, what is most important is that your lecture should be structured. It, it, it should be properly, uh, you know, structured. And I'll tell you how to, you know, prepare a structured lecture. Uh, which will be easy for the students to understand. <clears throat> now, for a lecture, I make uh, the four points, you know, uh, your, your lecture should have these four points, the topic, which of course, everybody, each one of us tells, you know, the students and outline. This is something which we do not tell the students. Number three, the most important part, establish where you are that doesn't happen, I'll tell you what is the meaning of that. Number four, to summarize, that again we do not do, right? So you need to ask a question to yourself, you know, because most of, uh, this is a, a, a FTP, so all of you are uh, respected teachers. You need to ask a question to yourself, you know, as to how you are delivering and are you following this particular method which I'm just going to tell you. Because uh, prior to, uh, 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 you know, attending this particular class where we were told about the delivery of the lecture. I had so many questions in mind, you know, whether I'm going to gain uh, something here or I'm going to waste my time. But at the end of the day, I was more than happy that I gained something and I'm sharing something with you. And I think you may find it uh, useful. <clears throat> Now, the first component, which I told you is the topic. Everyone, each one of us tells the topic, what we are going to teach them today, right? So tell the student, tell your students the topic you are going to teach in the beginning itself. Number one, number two, write it on the top of the blackboard 
or whiteboard, right? So nowadays, blackboards have been uh, replaced by whiteboard where the institution can afford, uh, you know, some expenditure and they are being used, uh, uh, the markers are being used to write on that. Write it even if you are making PPT presentation. So normally uh, you have Blackboard and you have the PPT, as, uh, you know, uh, LCD projector also. Even if you are making a PPT presentation, write down what is your topic on the Blackboard and do not erase it till the end. Why, I, why did I say so? See, uh, some, I mean, barring a few exceptions, mostly the teachers are quite liberal. The students are, many of the students enter the classroom late, right? And, uh, you know, if you are discussing something, if they enter the mid-class and they may not be having any clue as to what exactly is being discussed, so even though they are sitting there, they are trying to understand you, but then again, you know, because they are uh, they are not aware or either they will ask somebody, uh, you know, as to what is being taught. So that is why I say, uh, write the topic on the Blackboard, whether or not you are using Blackboard or, uh, you know, uh, PPT. Even if you are using Blackboard, well and good. If you are teaching PPT, still you have to write the topic, uh, uh, you know, and you are not supposed to erase it till that. Second component, which is very important and which can really uh, make your lecture more meaningful uh, and it will be very, uh, you know, beneficial for the students. Give them an outline of the lecture after you write down the topic. Tell them, uh, tell them briefly the things you are going to discuss in the lecture. This will enable them to understand the lecture in a proper way. Now they know what exactly you are going to discuss in, that, in this particular lecture. You can also write them on a side of the board, the outlines, the points which you are going to discuss and write it even if you are making the PPT. So, you know, a PPT has its uh, benefits, it, it, it has its flows also. Now, like you are seeing the PPT, I the moment I move on to the next PPT, you know, you do not know what exactly did I tell you uh, about the previous PPT. But if it is a blackboard, you know, I can write down certain thing on the blackboard on one particular side, which will remain there till the end of the class. So that kind of a facility is not there in the PPT. So even if you are teaching your students through PPT, remember that you should continue to use the blackboard or the whiteboard, right? That is uh, something very important. Third, component is establish where you are. Now this I told you that this is something which is very important. In between the lecture, establish where you are. This will help the students to learn the contents of the lecture and this will also help them to fill the missing links. This will also help the late coming students to know what portion of the subject has been covered in the lecture so far. Now, <clears throat> link component three with component two, where I told you about the outline which has to be written on the blackboard on one side, or which you have just discussed with them in the beginning itself, what we are going to discuss today. Now, when you start delivering your lecture, when you move from one point to another, you need to establish where you are. You need to communicate that, look, the discussion on the first point is over now i am moving on to the second point for example if you are discussing the sources you discussed sources of law could be international law could be some other family law or some other law. the moment you finish your discussion on the first source of law and when you move on to the second source you need to communicate communicate that look now the discussion on the first source is over and now we, we are moving on to the second uh, source. Why it is important? It is important because many a time the student is lost in between. Now, uh, how many of us, you know, uh, sit uh, as a good student in the class if, uh, if, if there is a physical class of one hour or two hours, how many of you, you know, would like to go to the class? I have seen most of, most of the teachers, you know, they, they are, they want to deliver lecture, but they do not want to listen. Now, this is, 
this is what i have observed you know even if we go to the class uh maybe that we are not very comfortable but if we have to take a class we are quite comfortable the students you know who are listening to their teachers for five or six hours right and if suppose the class is after the lunch and that too in summer so obviously you can understand you know uh, uh, what would be the state of uh, mental state of affairs of the students those who just had uh, their lunch you know and might be feeling sleepy some of them because ma many of them you know uh, uh, they uh, i mean work till late in the night they keep on studying you know uh, till late they sleep uh, late in the night so therefore at every point whenever you are changing one point to another you you need to establish yourself that i have done with first part i'm moving on to the second point or the third point or the fourth point now this will tell the student that okay now the discussion is over otherwise see what will happen if you do not tell and if the class is going uh, you know uh, i mean in in a in a continuous manner uh, the student will not be able to understand where the first point ended and when did the teacher started the second point the students the lowest students the students who were lowest you who were mentally not present in the class physically they were there but mentally they were absent so they will still be continuing that the teacher is talking about the first point whereas the teacher might have point this uh, uh, reach the second point or maybe the third point or so so if you keep on establishing yourself in between the lectures now the uh, student will be attentive the student uh, will immediately get to know that the discussion on the first point is over now even if he has missed something on the first point so he will be listening carefully about the second point right so this is something which is extremely important where you need to establish yourself where you are while delivering a lecture and that is something which we do not do right which we uh, do not do and this is something which is essential uh, for all of us to do because uh, you know all the students are not attentive we are human beings uh, and you know we have different nature you know there may be certain certain reasons you know where, when the students are present in the class but still you know mentally they are somewhere else and if you ask a question they'll you know they'll be shocked uh, you know and uh, the limit at least oh sorry sir i did not know what did you ask or what did you teach so they are looking at you they are sitting there but still you know mentally they are elsewhere the last component of the lecture is to summarize the lecture now do not end the lecture abruptly this is the problem in all of us most of us we end the lecture abruptly we finish it and we move out right summarize the lecture at the end you need to summarize the lecture what exactly did you teach on that particular day in that lecture this will help all the students to learn the lecture in the classroom itself so when you are telling them outlines in the beginning when you are establishing in between and telling them that now first point is over we are moving on to the second point or we are moving on to on to the third point and finally when you when you sum up the lecture when you give a summary of the entire lecture now you know the students the sincere students they will learn the lecture in the classroom itself and this will also help the late comer students to have a fair idea about the lecture i am not saying that you know uh, because because they were absent uh, for some part you know so obviously they will be missing something but when you summarize so they will also be benefited as to how this lecture had gone what are the things which were discussed by the teacher so they will also have a fair idea about the lecture uh this is a sample lecture uh, here i'll just uh, say one thing actually this presentation is uh, not meant uh, to be you know uh, delivered in the online mode it was meant uh, uh, to be delivered in a physical mode right but uh, uh, you know last evening i was just thinking what to do i just prepared a sample lecture so that i could discuss all the four components and uh, you know it, i mean you you will have to bear with me because do not try to read it because it will be too small 
on your screen. I'll just read it out. You, you can just uh, listen to me, right? Uh, I never advise the PPT to be made like this. I repeat, I never advise, you know, the teachers to make PPT like this. These are heavily, you know, loaded uh, PPT, uh, which should not be there. But because the topic is such where I wanted to give you a sample lecture also, therefore I had to put it like this, right? So do not read it. Uh, this will unnecessarily create a button on your eyes, you know, there will be a lot of strain. So this is one which I uh, made a small lecture on some uh, sources of international law. In fact, sources are, you know, you take a lot of lectures. In Delhi University, this uh, this is one module, the sources where we spent uh, several hours to uh, discuss all the sources. Now, how do we start? Hello, everybody, or good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are having the class. Today, we are going to discuss the sources of international law, right? So topic has been told to them. First of all, I'm going to outline the sources of international law. Then we will move on to examine various sources of international law. First of all, then, what are these sources of international law? Well, according to Article 38 of the Statute of ICJ, there are two categories of the sources of international law, primary sources and secondary sources. Now, there are three primary sources of international law. These are treaties, customs, and general principles of law recognized by civilizations. Then secondary sources are judicial decisions and juristic opinion of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations. Now, this is an outline which I have given after telling them the topic, which can be written on one side of the blackboard about the primary sources, the treaties, custom, and general principles, and about the secondary sources, the ju uh, judicial decision, and the juristic opinion. Now, if I go back for a moment to the primary sources, we are now starting the lecture, uh, you know, after giving the outline. Now, if we go back for a moment to the primary sources of international law, we find treaties to be the most important source of international law. Treaties can be of two kinds, bilateral treaties and multilateral treaties. Bilateral treaty operates between two states, whereas in case of multilateral treaty, there are many states which are parties to it. Treaties have codified the international law to a great extent. Now, this is one point, you know, I mean, this is just a sample. I'm repeating it, you know, you, you, you can't uh, finish treaties in one minute or two. Uh, you, you have to have, you know, a lot of discussion on that. So this is just for a sample only. Now, if we go back for a moment to primary sources of international law, establish where you are, here I am establishing where I am. If you go back for a moment to the primary source of international law, the second primary source is custom. Now here the students will get to know the first primary source, the discussion on first primary source has come to an end and the teacher has now moved on to the second primary source, which happens to be custom. Customs were the most important source of international law till the first half of 19th century. Customs mainly operate in absence of treaty law. <clears throat> now, let me explain to you the essentials of a custom. There are three essentials of a custom. The first of these three essentials is uniformity. This means that a custom should be uniform throughout. The second essential is consistency, which means that there should be no inconsistency in the practice of a custom. The third essential is opinio juris sub necessitatis, which means that states follow a custom as an obligation. Now, again, establish where you are because you have completed the second point. After treaties and customs, the third primary source is general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Now, the students are attentive because now they have come to know that the discussion on the first two sources have come to an end and then we have moved on to the third source. 
the general principles recognized by all major legal systems fall under this category again establish yourself because the point number discussion on point 3 is also over now before i move on to secondary sources do you have any question regarding any of the primary sources so you can give an opportunity to students after completing a particular point that if you have any question kindly let us know right now now we move on to second to second resources which consist of decisions of the international courts and tribunals and juristic opinion again you have established yourself that you have moved from primary sources to second resources as far as judicial decisions are concerned they are not having binding force as precedent as we see in national courts a judgment passed by international court is having binding force only among the parties to the case however a judgment of the international court may have normative value in absence of primary sources of international law so this is how you have described the secondary source now looking at the other secondary source again you have established yourself that out of the two secondary sources i have finished my discussion on the first one that is juristic opinion of most highly qualified publicist of the various nations we can see that opinions of jurist may be useful in law making process where there is no international law on a particular subject now my lecture is over the contents of my lecture are over but before i leave the class as i told you the fourth component comes into picture and the fourth component is to summarize your lecture to sum up then sources of international law can be divided into two categories primary sources and secondary sources primary sources include treaties customs and general principles of law recognized by civilized nations whereas secondary sources include judicial decisions and juristic opinion secondary sources are important in the absence of primary sources as they are considered as subsidiary means for the determination of rule of law here i have summarized it very briefly but you need to summarize it you know in a little elaborative manner otherwise it is the same thing what the outlines were which you told them in the beginning here based upon your discussion with the students or what you can do is that you can just say but one line about every source one line for treaties one line for custom one line for general principles one line for uh, uh, this uh, uh, i mean uh, judicial decision and one line for juristic opinion so i mean you need to summarize them so that all those students <laughs> <coughs> sorry all those students who lost their track somewhere would be able to get the missing link thank you very much for uh, bearing with me uh, with those loaded uh, slides now i'm not going to strain you uh, that much now here we start with the second part now should should i do the same thing what i told you do you have any questions or should i take the question at the end i think uh, we will will have a discussion uh, at a later stage because uh, the duration is 90 minutes and uh, i don't think that i'll be able to speak uh, for 90 minutes and then we'll have some questions how to deliver a lecture in the first slide i told you about the effective delivery of a lecture right so when i say how to deliver a lecture here i am talking of how to deliver a lecture effectively each one of us you know we go to class and deliver lectures but then the question is whether the class was uh, that delivery was effective or not to deliver a lecture is an art enter the classroom with a smiling face that is something very important you know i, I told you that uh, i have prepared these ppts uh, based upon my experience uh, in uh, the cardiff flow school and uh, you know while having interaction with others as a student when i looked at my teacher and as a teacher you know 
when I started teaching, uh, all these experiences I have just tried to, you know, you know put in uh, this particular slides. Smile even if you are not in good mood. You know, you had first lecture there, you had some sort of uh, unpleasant uh, or indisciplined uh, activity by some of the students, or maybe that you had some, uh, I mean, arguments with your head or with your dean or with your colleague, and then you are going to the class, you are going to the class in an annoyed manner, in dis with disappointed face, you know, that doesn't look nice, you know. Just leave whatever, whatever tension, whatever disappointment, whatever, you know, negativity was there in your, your mind. Just drop it, you know, before you enter the classroom. Wish them uh, by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening or hello. Now, in Indian culture, to be very honest, I mean, forgive me for saying so. Uh, you know, I have seen that some of the teachers, uh, uh, they say that, well, we are teachers, so the students uh, should uh, uh, wish us first. Uh, well, uh, what I feel is that, you know, that is correct, you know, uh, looking at the Indian culture, you know, the students, the disciples were, uh, they, they were supposed to do certain things. There was a code of conduct also. There were some written and unwritten, uh, you know, uh, way of behavior. But then the time is changing, you know. Do not, do not expect your student to wish you. Just, uh, you know, when you go to the class, you wish it, you know. It brings a lot of positivity. Trust me, you know, the students will be happy. They will be smiling. You will be smiling. And you know this is on. Uh, this is how you can start a lecture. Uh, even uh, even after becoming vice chancellor, I tell you that I do not expect my students to wish me. I'll just go and uh, you know if uh, some student comes, hello, beta, how are you? Or uh, what is going on? I, I mean, many of them I have seen that they do not wish you know. But then of course uh, you know if this has become a practice, let us accept it. So let us uh, be. I mean not very uh, conservative, be very liberal, go and wish in the class, you know, do not, uh, uh, you know, the students are not going to wish you and that is, uh, you know, there, but then it will be better if the teacher starts that. There is nothing wrong in doing that. Now, <clears throat> make the delivery in such a way that the students remain attentive. Uh, this is the most important task of a teacher in the classroom to make the students attentive, right? I'll come to that. Improve your communication skills. This is something extremely important. Uh, let me uh, tell you that many of the teachers, uh, you know, in the initial years of their uh, teaching, uh, maybe because uh, they are not from the English background, they, they did not study through uh, public schools or so, so they face some problems, uh, you know, in the beginning. But uh, trust me, you know, I have seen many such uh, teachers doing extremely well. You need to uh, improve your communication skills. I have seen many teachers who could not improve their communication skill even though they had experience of more than a decade or so. So something where you need to work. And if you are good in communication, then nothing like that. Use bear X and a copy of the adjustments you are likely to discuss in the class. Now, these are the minimum tools which you need to carry in the classroom. Note down the points of the contents to be covered in the lecture. Uh, I normally feel that, you know, if we are going to the classroom empty handed, you know, by putting our hands in our pocket, the pocket of the pant and we are moving to the class, we enter into the classroom and then we start, you know, somehow I feel that we are not going to do justice to the students. Somehow, exceptions apart, there are some very brilliant teachers, there is no doubt about it. But then at the end of the day, we, are, we have human memory, not computer memory, right? You need to carry something you know the at least the points which you are supposed to discuss in the class you need to carry the bare x or that uh, case material or the adjustments you know which you are supposed to discuss there otherwise sometimes you know i really uh, feel that well the teacher is really going to 
pass those 60 minutes in the classroom and the teacher is not that serious you know so therefore you need to carry minimum things with you at least have the notes otherwise when you start you know you might have thought that you will be covering all these aspects but you might have missed out on certain points as i told you that you do not have the computer memory so therefore better if you just note down what exactly you are going to discuss there in the classroom now how to make the student attentive this is something you know uh, which is a very tedious task maintain eye contact with all the students don't focus only on some of your students the moment you lose eye contact with your students they may indulge in unwarranted activities such as doing mischief talking chatting on mobile playing games etc etc don't let yourself trapped by some students only now just let me tell you uh, this again is something you know I i'll tell you you know the mischief uh, uh, which uh, is uh, done by the students and sometimes by the teachers also you know when they uh, join some fdp program like the present one and when they are sitting like student i'll share some experiences with you when i say maintain eye contact with all the students <clears throat> you know when you go to the class if it is a class of 60 students or 100 students or 40 students or whatever it is you will find that there are couple of students who are listening to you you carefully and who are responding to you through gestures by by nodding by by, by nodding by by looking into you know your eyes and by giving you an indication through gestures that they are very comfortable with the lecture they understood what you taught everything they will raise certain questions fine now what happens is that a teacher is then trapped by the attention of those students now this entire class you know it goes from the you know the teacher and those two three four students only rest of the class becomes the passive class only the active discussion is happening here now just think what are going to be the consequences the consequences would be the remaining people the remaining student who are sitting in the class they'll uh, they'll see that the teacher is not uh, uh, looking at us you know and maybe the discussion which is happening between teacher and the students maybe that the student is not able to understand what uh, that student has asked to the teacher because they are sitting at the back for example or maybe that the students are not interested in the query which has been raised by the student so what will happen they'll keep on talking they'll start making you know cartoons on their notebook maybe the cartoon of the teacher then start playing games uh one teacher i will just not uh, i won't uh, disclose his name his uh, uh, his a vice chancellor also he told me that he was uh, you know uh, teaching uh, uh, a class and there was a there was a student you know two students are sitting with their laptops in nlu this culture is there you know where the students come with laptops now the presumption is that uh, you know they are like writing notes on laptop or you know they are looking at some material or something you know and all of a sudden one of uh, them uh, shou uh, i mean he, he shouted like oh i have one that the teacher has taken him back and then he went there and found that uh, he was playing game on the uh, laptop uh what i mean to say is that you need to maintain eye contact with all of them like you know if your if your class is like this then it is much easier for you to maintain the eye contact if your class is like this you know as we have in the semicircle uh, way you know then obviously you need to have eye contact with all students sitting there and you have to like keep on moving your eyes towards everybody you have to look into the eyes of everyone right and if some students are giving you attention through their gestures 
stop looking at them otherwise you know you can just listen to them if they are speaking you can listen to them but then you can just you know look into the eyes of the others now this is something which is extremely important to maintain discipline in the class also and to prevent students to indulge into unwarranted activities but if you are trapped by those students three or four then you know the class is between you and those two three students only the class is not between you and all the students uh when i was a uh, young student uh, i mean sorry a young teacher though i am not that old even today i went uh, when i joined academics uh, i went uh, for uh, uh, a refresher course in one of the universities again uh, it is not uh, proper for me to tell you the name of that university <clears throat> there were several uh, uh, you know i mean there, there, there were teachers from all parts you know uh, of the country from one university there were there was a group of i think three teachers now they came uh, for a refresher course now they have a kind of tendency to you know trap the speaker the the person who is delivering the lecture and the moment he'll start doing that the person who is i mean uh, uh, who was uh, from his group you know no, normally we used used to sit there so he'll tell me uh, dr auja now look he 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 has uh, you know started trapping the uh, person you know now he'll keep on asking in such a manner he will trap and uh, and this is what used to happen you know uh, you know have this particular skill to come out of it not do not let one or two students take over the entire class listen to them carefully right but then i mean do not continue to look into their eyes otherwise uh, you know you are going to lose the control and the students are not going to be attentive the students you know there will be some indiscipline which will start happening so this uh, this again is something which is extremely important and you have to uh, understand that you need to avoid certain things uh these these things can be avoided or doing anything unusual or awkward that should not happen in the class otherwise you know uh the students uh, are very naughty i tell you very honestly the students are very naughty they make fun of the teachers and if you are doing something awkward or unusual they'll start imitating you or you know making fun of you so please i mean you need to introspect you need to have a peer review also you need to know from your your friend you know whom you can trust and if suppose there is something wrong with your delivery or uh, you know or you are doing something which you are not expected to do then maybe that person may may you know like uh, indicate you that where you are going wrong if you adopt chalk and walk method and show that you do not uh, toss the pieces of chalk or throw on student to discipline them i remember <laughs> you know during our days the teacher will throw the piece of chalk you know on the student uh, if uh, some student was like uh, uh, talking don't do that never do that some of the teachers were uh, you know in in the habit of you know throwing the uh, remaining piece of the chalk like this so if you start tossing chalk then again you know the student will have more attention on that tossing rather than on your lecture so do not do any such kind of a thing repeating a particular word time and again for example you see or understand we keep on repeating a word time and again time and again time and again so many times in one of the refresher courses i found one of my colleague who was also attending refresher course from uh, law faculty uh, he was from the center of uh, dr grish uh, you so after the class you can ask him the name also he was sitting with me and uh, he was writing something on uh, the notebook you know 
I was wondering, I thought that the teacher did not tell that important which has to be noted down. So when I looked at this notebook, what he was doing was plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. Plus one. I said, what are you doing? What the hell is this? He said, look, this man is in the habit of uh, repeating this particular word. And I'm just adding plus one, plus one, how many times he spoke that word. And it was 100 and some, uh, something, you know, times that he spoke that particular word in the entire lecture, which was of, I think, uh, uh, one and a half hours or so. Please, please, if you are in the habit, introspect, take the help of your peer also. If you are in the habit of repeating, you know, you see, understand, okay, 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 keep on telling students, okay, okay. Now this I have seen in many of the people that they do that, don't do that. Unusual get up, for example, big mustache or male teacher using earring or wearing unusual dresses. These are some things which can be avoided. I'm not making, you know, a comment. See, now the time is there, uh, uh, you know, that the people are becoming more liberal. They are wearing earrings uh, also, and they are wearing sometimes unusual dresses or say, for example, if uh, or in Rajasthan, this is a culture of having the big mustache. Because what I have seen is that uh, in some of the teachers, the, the students put their name actually on their habits or something, you know. And, uh, you know, since uh, I'm from Delhi, uh, a belt, you know, which is Hindi spoken. I do not know how many of you are comfortable in Hindi. So I'm not using those words. But the teachers, the students, you know, they start naming the teachers on the basis of their habits or their looks. So therefore, I mean, the simple look is always better. When I say uh, wearing unusual dresses, see, remember, I respect every culture. Uh, I'm in the Northeast. In the Northeast, there are many, you know, traditional dresses. Those traditional dresses are not unusual, right? What is unusual? The, you know, jeans where there are hundreds of holes as you see nowadays happening. And then you are wearing t-shirt. And then, I mean, you are wearing something, you know, of that kind of a thing. That, that is something which is to be avoided. If the student is doing, let them, but should not be done by a teacher. Coming in the traditional dresses, your, your cultural dresses, that is the acceptable uh, uh, thing, you know, acceptable practice. So there is nothing wrong in that. In UK, uh, the literature which was circulated to us, <laughs> that has pointed out what you should wear in the classroom. I mean, when you go to the classroom, what should be your dress? You should wear light color suit with dark color shoes. Now, in one of the literature which was provided to us, this was written. I was wondering, you know, why? If you go to, again, if I just tell you about the colleges of the university and some of the universities, uh, the private universities particularly, do you think that the teachers are being paid that much of salary where they can afford, you know, a number of uh, suits and a number of shoes which are matching with them? Why to have that? Number one. Number two. The climatic conditions in India are very hostile at various places. I'm sitting in Guwahati. Trust me, you know, uh, during in, in, in the night when I go back uh, in the evening, even I do not require a fan. The temperature is 22 or something like that. I was in Delhi a week back. Temperature was 40, 43. It was, you know, horrible. There was a, a dust storm yesterday. If you go to Kashmir during winter, Ladakh, it goes to minus 40. Can, can, can you come in suit? No, you will have to wear, you know, a kind of dress which can cover you, which can give you enough warmth. So 
traditional dresses are okay what i am saying is that unusual dresses should not be uh, used by the by 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 the teachers look should be simple you know that is something very important otherwise the concentration or the focus of the students is on your unusual look rather than on the knowledge which is being imparted by you now tell in advance what you are going to teach in the next class that again is something very important you know before you leave the class after summarizing your lecture before before you leave you will tell them that in the next class we will discuss this particular thing or this particular aspect and encourage students to read before they come to the class so that your task becomes easier and the students uh, are also in a position to understand because they have already read something about that and if they have doubts you can clear those doubts learning is a two way process make your class interactive rather than simply delivering lectures to them remember one thing if a teacher is good the credit goes to his student also if if you if you are lucky to have good students the good students will make you to read thoroughly make you to think about certain things make you to change your perception at certain places when a student ask you a question which is not that comfortable for you you go back to library or to your uh, residence or to a place you know or to your chamber and you start reading that particular thing you start finding the answer to that particular question and in the process of doing that you read many things and that is a contribution to your intellect and the course is course is the question of the student that particular student therefore i always say that learning is a two way process do not do not think that only you know everything and therefore what you are teaching is the correct thing no in analysis the students are quite demanding you know they'll raise some very interesting very intelligent questions and they will many a times they will make you to understand uh, make you to learn certain more things you know and this is the beauty you know uh, uh, grish knows dr grish knows in delhi university i used to teach at uh, law center too where i was uh, professor in charge later on <clears throat> that used to be in the south delhi in the evening 6:15 to 9:15 top bureaucrats of the country who were posted in delhi they used to take admission in llb and we used to teach them i was teaching income tax and there used to be several commissioner of income tax joint commissioner deputy commissioner assistant commissioner income tax officers they were there you know who were who were administering that particular act and giving them lecture is not an easy thing they'll immediately correct you if your interpretation is not correct there were lot of ca cs icwa those who were sitting in the class when you teach when you used to teach criminal law you'll find that the joint commissioner deputy commissioner of police assistant commissioner acp and sho and everybody you know uh, from the police is sitting there when you were teaching ipr you will find that the people from controller general of uh, patent trademark uh, and designs office you know the jo joint uh, uh, controller and the deputy controller and assistant controller they were sitting there the registrar of copyright is your student now can you can you just think of making them fool no you cannot you will have to study and the moment they'll ask you question they'll make you think and again you will read and again you will answer to them and in that process you learn a lot if your students are simply dumb you know not interested you go there i mean they are sitting they they are not interested in you or they are listening to you they are not asking you they are not interacting it does not make any difference for them whether somebody some teacher comes to the class or doesn't come to the class what will happen you will go to the class you will deliver your lecture you will pass your time you will walk out there is no motivation for you to read more so therefore if a teacher is a, a good teacher you know 
the credit also goes to his students because his good students made him to learn more and that is why you know he has become a good teacher today interaction makes the class attentive so that is again important thing you know i told you in the beginning that you are you, you need to make the students attentive and when you are interacting with them the class will remain attentive because the every student will know or the teacher may ask me a question also or the teacher may look at me also so let me not indulge into any unwarranted activity <clears throat> now this again is something very interesting you know don't avoid questions of the students you can take a few questions in between but if there are there is lot of questioning you can tell them for likely to raise the question at the end don't answer wrongly if you don't have an answer tell them politely that you will answer in the next class but do answer their question in the next class as a student i had the experience if we ask some question to the teacher he will get offended he will feel offended i have seen teachers humiliating students who raised questions so if there is no question the teacher is comfortable he need not give any question but the student uh, you know he will feel that if i last you i will be humiliated so he'll keep quiet this is a very dangerous practice unethical practice dishonest practice right all those teachers who who are avoiding questions or who are humiliating students for asking question they are doing injustice kindly don't do that we are human beings not we are not expected to know each and everything of some of a particular topic even a judge who delivers a judgment is being given the legal advice by the lawyers of two sides the judges also have their researchers their staff to help them right so you cannot expect a teacher you know to know everything we are human beings we all have our own limitations please take up the questions if you do not know tell them that you will answer this particular question and by chance if you have answered a question wrongly in the next class you can have a further discussion on that and then say that this exactly is the answer and not the one which i have given very politely you know just change your answer if you feel later on that your answer was wrong to the question which was asked so we are teachers every day you know when you go to the class if you feel nervous before going to the class it is a very healthy sign that means that you know that there may be questions that will make you to read to revise your lecture before going to the class and if you say oh class i oh, i am coming i am coming you know i have class if you are taking it for granted then nobody can help it you know uh, this is something which is not expected of a teacher maintain your pitch you should be audible your your pitch your voice should go to the last bench that's all do not unnecessarily raise your pitch to a point at which it becomes irritating i have seen both type of teachers the one i mean who speak so slow that the students keep on complaining sir we are not able to listen to you can you be little louder i have also seen teachers who whose pitch is so high so high that you know even the teachers who are teaching in the neighboring rooms in the adjacent rooms they are complaining that kindly maintain your pitch regulate your pitch you know please speak slowly we we are being disturbed i have seen those teachers also if the teachers in the adjacent rooms are uh, being you know like uh, they are uncomfortable and uh, you know they are feeling lot of uh, problems uh, because of the lot of noise coming from the other room think about that particular room where the teacher is speaking i have seen that also right 
so kindly maintain your pitch raise your pitch to the extent which is acceptable beyond that it becomes nuisance it becomes irritating particularly for the students who are sitting on the front benches so that again is something which you should always keep in mind commitment for inclusive education this is uh, something very very interesting well friends uh, i'll just uh, tell you something uh, this uh, 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 this is a college i suppose of uh, university of kerala madam bismi i am right this is a university college na school of, school of indian legal thought it's acha this is a part of the university yes yes very good it's a part of the university sir it's a university department very good now in delhi university we were uh, having uh, some problem because i was professor in charge i was head of my center and i do not know maybe that you may also be having the similar problem we have lot of students who come from the pwd category right now there are people who are visually impaired also when we go to the class we deliver our lecture from the point of view of a normal uh, student who has at least an average you know iq or so or higher iq or so have you ever thought of the student who is visually impaired he may have better iq than the others but he may not be having the reading material in the accessible format copies for example braille or daisy or in audio you know or in similar kind of what i have seen is that these students you know they deserve our attention therefore a teacher is required to come down to their level do not try to speak in such a language in such a high fi language and in such a manner you know which can be understood by some of the students only no you need to remember that if there are students you know who are from pwd category or who are from other sections you know where socio economic or disadvantaged section where they require your attention more so many a times you have to come down to their level remember nep national education policy 2020 uh, the rpwd uh, act the rights of persons with disability act the convention on disability all these instruments they talk about inclusive education which means that all students will sit in the same class and study it's not that you are going to have a different class for pwd students no for their overall growth their over, overall development it is necessary that they should be a part of the same class and for that particular purpose if you prepare a lecture in such a manner which goes on the you know over the head of those students then again you are doing injustice to those students right and sure that you help them to get the accessible format copy from the library from the ngo from any any other place now the copyright act also allows you to do that in 2012 they had made this particular amendment and in 2014 we had already joined the marrakesh treaty for uh, you know providing the uh, published material in accessible format copy so it is not a violation of the copyright if you are helping uh, to convert the publish material into accessible format copy and providing it to those students the pwd students friends it is the duty of each one of us that we have to look into their interest also if we will not look into their interest who will look into their interest i you know i used to interact with uh, some of the pwd students because we have lot of pwd students we have lot of seats for them one day and and most of them you know they said sir we require we need uh, uh, books in hindi language because in delhi university 
you can write in hindi but the medium of his instruction remains english only so some some students they write in hindi also uh i told my students that you give me a list of the hindi books i'll get it uh, purchased for the library i'll get it issued on my cards to all of you right don't worry you just give me a list then they said sir it's not about the book alone we need accessible format copy and converting a hindi book into accessible format copy that facility i mean one of the students told me that it was not in delhi, there in delhi university delhi university had it tie up with some ngo i do not know whether it is correct or incorrect but what i mean to say is that if you have students <coughs> who are from pwd who are from other socio economic uh, uh, disadvantaged background or so where they require your attention kindly kindly for god's sake look into uh, i mean ask them help them if necessary give them extra time take their extra class also or you know i mean just come down to their level to i mean don't think that i am a teacher I, i have a particular level only no that is of no use come down to the level of the student try to make them understand you know otherwise your teaching is of no use at all fine now finally friends there are four type of teachers the mediocre teacher tells the good teacher explains the superior teacher demonstrates the great teacher inspires it is open to you in which category would you like to fall what kind of teacher you would like to become i have to stop it here otherwise this is what is going to happen <laughs>